live. I'm going to try to talk at a more monotone voice today as there is someone going to sleep in the house and they need me to be quiet. So let's pull in TikTok. Two, one. All right, we are live back for our Friday live stream. And today we are going to talk about learning to live free. And we're going to approach this from a couple of different angles, but I really wanted to talk about teaching children their rights from an early age so that they grow up knowing it. And then the other aspects of living free, because for those of you that might not be familiar with my story, as we let the people trickle in, I not only started a homeschool company and I teach this stuff, I work on teaching children their rights and how to live free and um, all of this stuff, but I've really lived it myself. And I've done that by following a few basic principles that have allowed me to really live life on my terms. And through my homeschool company, I've been able to help other people with that. I know a lot of people know me as kind of a truther, right? They like my historical videos. They like my truth or videos, but that that's the least important of what I do. I mean, that's the stuff that gets all the traction, but really it's the nitty gritty of how do we teach the next generation to know their rights? How do we teach the next generation to live free? Because if we can't do that, I always tell people, what is the function? What is the purpose of all of us spending so much time trying to wake everyone up? if the next generation is being indoctrinated by the public school system. Hello, I'm a homeschool parent, just discovered your stuff. Well, you've come to the right place and today we're going to talk about teaching children their rights. And one of the things I really like to do from a young age, I think it's really important is to give them a foundation in America's foundation so that they have a connection to the origins of America. And that doesn't mean we don't teach the bad stuff. That doesn't mean we don't teach um, very interesting things like the founding fathers being Freemasons and all that stuff. Yes, they need to know that. Like Ben Franklin, um, you know, 200 years after he died, having dead bodies found in the basement of the house he used to live. That children need to know that. But they also need a connection to how this country was founded because the truth is, that this is good, that the Constitution is good, that the checks and balances system is a good thing, that living in a republic rather than a monarchy or a dictatorship or a democracy is a good thing. That's right. We live in a republic, not a democracy. Yes, he literally had skeletons in his closet, right? But that's a good thing, right? The Bill of Rights is a really good thing. I mean, Americans take it for granted, right? That you have a First Amendment right. And they say, oh, but don't you know they violate those rights? Well, yeah, you know, your rights only exist as far as you understand how to exercise them, as you understand how to protect them. And if you don't know how to exercise your rights, if you don't know how to protect your rights, well then the government or corporations or non-governmental organizations or banks, they will come in, insurance companies, they will come in and they will violate those rights and they'll take it as far as they can go. And we saw that with everything that happened from March of 2020 and onward, right? They rolled out the big world agenda and they basically said your home is going to be a prison. And they said, you cannot work unless you comply with our dictates, right? And they used financial leverage. They used regulatory leverage over corporations, right? So they used these different tools in an attempt to take away your rights. And for those people that don't know how to defend their rights, well, then they didn't really have them. The strength of the Constitution lies in the will of the people to defend it. Yes, and 
the most interesting thing, and it gets so lost that we truly do live in a land governed by the consent of the people. And you say, well, how can you say that? Look what's happening in New York. Look what's happening in California. Well, they're getting the government they want. They're consenting to that, right? And populations that had a more moral foundation were able to better push back against the tyranny that we saw the last few years. But ultimately, with all of that, and, and you know, part of that's because they understood where their rights come from, right? Your rights don't come from government, right? They're not um, arbitrary. We are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. So when I start, I like to give children a foundation from the time they are young so that they have a connection to America's roots because a tree without roots is very easy to rip out of the ground. And when you see what's happening in the public school system, why they're making sure children don't have a connection to the founders, it's because they want your child to be a tree with short roots so they can rip that metaphorical tree of your child's rights out of the ground. Now, you have the liberal group of people in America who hate America's founding. I mean, they are very far gone. They're taught that um, because there was slavery, right, or because women weren't voting, that everything that happened with the founding of the country is nonsense, right, that it was, it was founded in hate, and therefore the book doesn't protect them at all. They should throw it out and you know, they would want a new constitution that protects people from hate speech, right? Not giving them free speech. So that's how they get those people. And then they get the right-wing people. They get the right-wing people by um, pointing out things like the founding fathers being Freemasons. And they say, well, don't you know they were so bad? Don't you know they were bad? Don't have any connection to them. Don't have any connection to them, Right? hate speech is not free speech. Well, I, I hate your speech. Maybe I should just get you out of here. So, um, so we want our children to have a connection, but the system makes sure that they don't have that. So we teach the whole history, but we teach why it's important. So when you teach your children their rights, you start with the American Revolution, and specifically, you really want to start with what happened from the French and Indian War, maybe like 13 years, um, from the French and Indian War until 1776. Because you can't understand the Bill of Rights unless you understand that Ben Franklin felt so strongly about free speech. Ben Franklin felt so strongly about freedom of the press. Give it, we know the media today has been corrupted, but I'm the press. Right? I'm the press right now. You're the press. Right? Ben Franklin felt so strongly about that because his mm -hmm. brother, James Franklin, was arrested for exercising freedom of the press, was arrested for exercising free speech. In fact, most people don't know this, but when he was ultimately arrested, he had published a satire letter to himself explaining to himself why he shouldn't make fun of the government because they'll shut down his speech. And then they responded by arresting him. The comedy of our day. Heaven for y'all is actually hell. Well, I, I live in heaven. I live on heaven on earth. I, um, I get my freedom from the way in which I live my life. I, you know, I, I'm a homesteader. I don't live beyond my means. I live my life without debt, right? I run my own business that I built up from the grassroots level. And when you do these things, it makes it very difficult for the government to come along and say, you know, if you don't put on the mask, you can't um, pay your bills. Well, you know, you start to structure your life so that they don't have that type of control over you, right? Or they say, you can't go to the grocery store. Well, I actually grow my own food. That takes an immense amount of personal responsibility. And that's what we're teaching our children the personal responsibility that it requires to live a free and independent life. And we start that from a very young age and we start that with our example.
This guy's talking about dinosaurs. He's talking, he said, don't teach the children about the founding fathers. I'm talking about dinosaurs. Yeah, I mean, you gotta bring a stronger argument than that. I'm talking about the foundation of America and giving our children a foundation, and you're talking about dinosaurs. I mean, come on, you gotta go a little bit harder than that. So the children have to understand why Ben Franklin thought freedom of speech was important. The children have to understand that through the intolerable acts, which were acts um, authorized by King George III and Parliament in Britain that the colonists had no say over, they were not allowed to have meetings um, of groups of, I forget how many people it was, more than like six people. They weren't allowed to gather and protest, right? Which is why in the First Amendment, we have those rights, right? That freedom of religion, well, the, the people that came to America, they came here because they were escaping religious persecution from the royal family in England. Because before their parents had come here, the family of King George III had declared that they had been endowed by God as the rulers of the world. This is what they proclaimed, the King of England. Right? They had been endowed by, you know, that they were the rulers and that everyone had to be members of the Church of England. And if you weren't and you didn't go to their um, mass, then what would happen? You would be arrested, drawn and quartered, right? Which is why they were against cruel and unusual punishment. All of these things that are in the Bill of Rights, they, they have a foundation. There was a reason for them that John Hancock had his ship confiscated without a trial, right? Without a trial. So they said, no, no, we need trials. We can't just have this. In fact, at Lexington and Concord, when Paul Revere rode and said, the British are coming, the British are coming. People don't ask why were the British coming? They were ordered by King George to confiscate all of the firearms at the munitions building. That's where the British were going. That's what they were coming to do which is why the Second Amendment is so important. And they were ordered to arrest John Adams and John Hancock, at which point both were to be executed for treason. So when you start to understand all of this, children start to understand the reason for these rights. But what the school system is teaching is, no, no, don't look at the reason for that. What you need to look at is, Look how flawed these men were. Look how flawed Thomas Jefferson was. Look at the hypocritical nature through which Thomas Jefferson lived his life. And he did do that in many ways. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner, yet he was one of the most important figures in the history of humanity for ending slavery. I'll repeat that. Thomas Jefferson arguably did more to end the institution of slavery than any person in human history. You say, well, Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln did that. Well, Lincoln couldn't have done what he did if Thomas Jefferson didn't cut out the economic impetus that drove the North Atlantic slave trade, right? Because in 1812, Thomas Jefferson, and this was, if you go back and read his autobiography, I mean, this was his life's work. He fought hard against slavery, Thomas Jefferson, yet he had slaves, the contradiction. But in the end, Thomas Jefferson not only was behind the end of the North Atlantic slave trade into Virginia when he was in the colonies, but as president of the United States, he ended the North Atlantic slave trade. He ended the North Atlantic slave trade, which crushed the economics of everything around slavery and ultimately allowed the complete abolishment of slavery, um, 65 minus 12, 63, 53 years later. 53 years later by Abraham Lincoln. So they would say Thomas Jefferson is this terrible man. No, Thomas Jefferson is one of the greatest champions of liberty in human history. In fact, many people talk about his um, tree of liberty quote. They say, um, the tree of liberty sometimes need to be, needs to be refreshed with the blood of patriots and tyrants. That was a famous Thomas Jefferson quote. And they think that's about the American Revolution 
It wasn't. That was a quote about Shay's Rebellion. And after Shay's Rebellion, when, after Shay's Rebellion, when the governors of the United, of the America were saying, what did we do? This is a really bad thing. This is what happened. And they were all freaking out. Thomas Jefferson said, this is a great thing. He said, those farmers in Massachusetts had the very rights that we fought a revolution for squashed. I'll tell you what Shay's Rebellion was in a second. They had their rights squashed. And then he did the famous quote, that the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Thomas Jefferson. And he would use what happened with Shay's Rebellion to say that we absolutely need a First Amendment. We absolutely need a Second Amendment. There would not be a Bill of Rights without Thomas Jefferson. He is one of the greatest champions of liberty in all of human history. Yet what are children taught in school? That was a bad man. What are they taught about George Washington in school? That was a bad man. And because of that, they are giving children shallow roots so that they can be ripped out of the ground. Their rights can be ripped from underneath them. So the first thing we do in early childhood education when we are introducing children to America is we give them a connection to the foundation of their rights. And by a connection, I mean understanding the circumstances that preceded the Bill of Rights so they understand why we have the Bill of Rights. It is one thing to memorize that this is what this book says. It is another thing to understand why this book says what it says. That is what the school system is failing to do. And that is what you as a parent can step in and do. You don't have to do it alone. I'm happy to help. But you as a parent could step in understanding the principles outlined today and do it yourself. Now, I did say, what was Shay's Rebellion? So I'll, I'll cover that really quick. And then we'll get to the next step in what we need to do in teaching children to understand their rights, but not only understand their rights, to exercise their rights. And then after they understand their rights and know how to exercise those rights, we will discuss how to teach them to live a free and independent life. Because ultimately it's very difficult to exercise and protect your rights if you are not in a leveraged position where you can live a free and independent life. Everything comes together when we're talking about an education worthy of freedom, which every patriotic, red, white, and blue blooded American should be focused on giving their children. And by the way, you should be having lots and lots of children. Do not complain to me that your country is being overrun, that you are being replaced if you don't have children. That is the battle. That is why they have created the circumstances, the social culture, right? Through um, the promiscuous hookup culture, right? The divorce culture, everything about it, the don't have kids or, you know, the planet culture, everything about that is you being usurped. That is the modern form of colonialism, right? They do that through open borders, right? So you need to have children. You need to do your part. And then you'll understand a crazy thing happens that your life gets infinitely better when you stop living for you and you start living for the people in your family and the people around you. I think about, I think back to when my grandmother passed away and she was an amazing woman. She was about 95, 96 years old. And she was home. We knew she was going to die that week. They were basically just giving her end of life care. They told her that she could have heart surgery or she could go out her way. And she lived like healthy as an ox up to the final week of her life. And she said, no, no surgery. I'm ready to go. And she was laying there on her bed and around her were myself and my brother and my sisters and my parents and extended family and all of these grandchildren running around and imagine to think that people wouldn't want that at the end of their life because they were busy chasing materialistic things because they were trying to hook up with another girl or hook up with another guy or um, they wanted that car they wanted that bag 
That's not how you live free. That's what the system wants you to do. There is nothing more fulfilling in this world than having a family of your own. And don't ever let anyone take that from you. Don't let them use their propaganda to take that from you. Because there's nothing the demons want more. There is nothing that the demons want more than to take that from you. So, Shays' Rebellion happened after the American Revolution. We're talking about, it started in 1980, um, 19, 1785. And what had happened was after the revolution, the European, um, the European merchants stopped extending credit lines to the American merchants. Debt is the weapon. This is why we have to teach our children real history, because then we could teach them why it's important to live life. Hey, Foster Bear, why it's important to live your life outside of debt. So the merchants were in debt to the European merchants, the American merchants. And the European merchants said, no more credit for you. You have to pay us up front in cash. They didn't have the cash. So what did the merchants do? The American merchants went to the American farmers and they said, sorry guys, I know that we were also extending you credit to get your farming materials, but now we have to pay the European merchants in cash. So you have to pay us in cash. They passed on the bill to the farmers. The farmers who had been paying in credit as well, they were in debt. The farmers, all of a sudden, they had to pay in cash. They didn't have it. So they spent the cash they could on the materials they needed. And then they would either not be able to pay back the merchants in which the merchants would take them to court and they could go to debtor's prison they could lose their farm or they would pay the merchants, but, but they wouldn't have money to pay their taxes. They'd go to court and their property would be confiscated. Well, 1785, this is a cluster of a situation, especially after no taxation without representation in the Revolutionary War. So what happened? Samuel, I'm sorry, um, John Hancock who was actually the governor of Massachusetts at the time, he was refusing to prosecute farmers who were delinquent on their taxes. And he was getting immense political pressure from, um, from the bureaucratic class, um, from the rich class. And ultimately what he did was he stepped down. He resigned as governor. New governor takes over, starts prosecuting the farmers, the farmers are losing their farms. They're losing their land. What do they do? Shays Rebellion. They organize. They start shutting down courthouses. If the judge can't get into court, then he can't make a ruling so the government can take the farm. That's what they were doing um, in 1786 at this time. And um, ultimately, you know, ultimately, um, everything boiled over to a head. And where was the big battle in Shays Rebellion? We talked about Lexington and Concord. We talked about why children need to have a connection to their rights and understand the why of the Second Amendment. When the American Revolutionary War started, Lexington and Concord, Paul Revere's ride, the, the Redcoats are coming. The Redcoats were ordered to confiscate the firearms. That's why they were coming. Well, in Shays' Rebellion, the first major battle was fought at the Springfield Armory. They fought the battle over getting the firearms. And ultimately, Shea, they would lose um, because one of their units couldn't arrive the day the attack was supposed to happen. And their opposition, the government, intercepted the telegram saying that one of those military units wouldn't arrive. They didn't have a chance. They, they had bad intel. They got beat back. Children need to understand the why of the Second Amendment. And then this way, when the news media runs all of their propaganda and all of their nonsense, and the schools do their ridiculous drills, which we can only imagine the psychological effects of telling children that there's a madman with a weapon and all you can do is hide underneath your door, hide in the closet. What? How about we teach them how to defend themselves? 
Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Brian Russ has a good point. He said, why don't we ban guns? I got a better one, Brian. Why don't we ban murder and stealing? Eh? Hello, Brian? Is anyone home? Hello? McFly? Ooh. No, I mean, this isn't rocket science. You don't have to arm the children. What you do is you allow the adults, the teachers, to exercise their Second Amendment rights. And then, just like a police station, all of a sudden doing anything nefarious in that location becomes very difficult. In fact, if you lived where I live, where everyone is carrying, like everyone carries, there's not shootings all the time, believe it or not. You know why? Because there's a little thing called F around and find out. A little thing called F around and find out. But yeah, yeah I, I see what you're saying. Why did they just ban guns? Did you not hear the whole talk I just gave on the American Revolution and Lexington Concord? You are a brainwashed child who's now an adult who had no connection to your roots. So it was very, it was very easy for them to rip you out of the ground. And now you're begging them to take your rights. You're begging them to take your rights. You can watch my past streams at the Classical Learner YouTube page. The Classical Learner YouTube page. So, but don't beg them to take your rights. Don't do that. Instead, exercise your rights. And then exercise some logic. Because, you know, you're like, why don't they ban guns? Why don't they ban murder? Why don't they ban stealing? I mean, that's you. I mean, you have to be like a child to think that. I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I don't need to come that hard on you, but can we talk about the logical... I mean, what's not clicking there? What's not clicking? You let the teachers carry. The problem solved. They know that. You think they don't know that? You ever heard of MK Ultra? They're just messing with your mind, man. If you play outside, but you have to watch them, and if you come in, you have to bring them back. If mom's okay with it. No, right, let's see what the people. Mom's a true dad. He's a true. You're gonna overthrow capitalism. So what? You want no upward mobility in your life? Don't get me wrong. Capitalism has its problems, but overthrowing capitalism is like a brain dead solution. Who wants to live in a world where there's no upward mobility, where you can't work and like the, their American dream is actually a thing. Now they changed the American dream. The banks did in like the 1950s. And this is, I mean, it's a combination of capitalism and socialism because the banks are socialist, but they did this in the 1950s and they convinced you that the American dream that the American dream is everyone owns a house. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to get everyone into debt, which we, this is why you need to have those roots we talked about. Remember I was talking about the roots and the farmers are being in debt, right? So the bankers, they said, if we convince everyone the American dream is to take out loans, we can get everyone into debt, right? And then they come across with their nonsense narratives. They say, Look at all these disadvantaged people. We, we have to give all the minorities loans. We have to. And, you know, you think they're helping. No, they're not. They're, try, they're trying to make a slave of you, an indentured servant, I should say, the modern form of that. That's what they're trying to do. But you're volunteering for it. You're volunteering. This, where, this is when Ye came out. Remember he said it's a choice? That's what he's talking about. You're like, oh, my God, get outraged. Think, think. So they came out. They said the American dream you got to get a house. And they started giving out everyone loans. And of course, that's why the, not only is everyone in debt, but that's why no one could afford a house today. Because as soon as the banks start increasing the supply of money for the houses, the price will go up and up and up and up until after a few generations, young people can't afford a house without being in crippling lifetime debt. It's a pretty good scheme. It's a pretty good scheme. 
Before that, the American dream was rooted in something called rugged individualism, right? It was you start a business, you live within your means, and you build up. So maybe you get a plot of land without a house on it, and you start in a trailer. And then um, over time, you go from a trailer to a yurt, and then a yurt to a small house, right? And then after a generation or two of doing this without getting in debt, so you have sound money because you're not in debt, you could start to accumulate wealth, you start to pass on real wealth to your children. This was the American dream. This is what they took away from us. And this is what people have been conditioned through propaganda, through marketing, through the erosion of the American education system and not teaching children their roots. And this is how they have um, effectively um, turned us all into indentured servants. So the problem isn't capitalism. The problem is the manner through which you're living your life. Capitalism is beautiful. Um, capitalism is upward mobility. Capitalism is how you go from being poor to um, living a life that is your dream. My dream, um, which I, I've carried out, my dream was to move to the country um, and to start homesteading. And that's what I do. I homestead. I grow my food. I take care of my chickens and my animals, right? I'm building a big animal pen right now that, again, I, I could go into debt right now, pay someone a lot of money to build an elaborate animal pen, go get my goats tomorrow. And what I've been doing is piecemealing it together, building this big animal pen, and when I'm ready, I'll get my goats. The American dream, rugged individualism. That's the dream. That's what they took away from you. But we are going to teach our children how to get it back. Lakata had bomb drills and is reporting that he is mentally just fine. That's good. That's good. Now, may I ask you, what are your thoughts on the, um, the situation in Ukraine? Uh, we're going to have to have this capitalism, communism, socialism talk again. They got you in a binary. They say capitalism good, communism bad. They're just systems. Communism is bad because there's no upward mobility and it's um, authoritarian in nature because the government has a lot of centralized power in communism. Um, capitalism is just as bad in many ways it almost becomes the tyrannical feminine where it's going to trick you and manipulate you into doing horrible things, right? Um, I mean, capitalism, look at the food, right? The food is um, atrocious. They're poisoning us, right? And that's a, that's a real thing. Look at um, all of the endless wars, wars fought over oil, uh, wars fought, right? That's, that's the horror of capitalism. People are like, oh, one good, one bad. They both have committed... Tremendous atrocities. Capitalism is a better system. You better believe you want to live in, under capitalism and not communism. But, you know, there's no, it's not like, oh, that's, this is the great system, right? I mean, ultimately it comes down to how moral your population is. What, what does your population tolerate? What can your population be fooled into accepting? And from what we've seen, it's, it's a sure lot. It's very hard to box me in. Ignore the haters, love the history lesson. Oh yeah, we have to get back to the next part of teaching our children their rights, but I just wanted to go through these comments. Saw your video on John Adams, awesome. There's a difference between capitalism and monopoly. No, that, that's the no true Scotsman argument. That's a, that's a logical fallacy. That's like saying, that's like when you say, look how communism failed and they say, and they say, well, that, that wasn't real communism. Of course it was real communism. What are you talking about? You say, oh, well, monopoly is not capitalism. That's not real capitalism. Yes, it is. And I'll tell you what, because under a capitalistic system, 
you will have people that start to accumulate money. They will take said money and they will put it behind politicians and they will start to have influence over the politicians. They will take said money, they'll buy media companies, they'll start to have influence over the minds of the people until the point where inevitably there will be monopolies and there will be abuses. This is the inevitable abuse of the capitalistic system, but it's a better system than socialism. It's a better system than, um, better system than communism. Yes, the banks are socialist, which is why it's like America is a cluster of a mixture of, I mean, America is like, has capitalist ideals, ideals, is governed by socialist banks and teaches children to be communist, which is a very interesting dynamic of what's actually happening in America, but that's what's happening in America. I only, I call it like I see it. I, <laughs> that's what's happening. All right. The banks have been chipping out away at America since before the Titanic sank. Yes, they have. Go back to Andrew Jackson. The great fight with the banks. The last president to really stand up to the banks. But don't you know the trail of tears? It doesn't change that he stood up to the banks. Yeah, capitalism is fantastic. Anyone who's like, there shouldn't be upward mobility is just, you're like, I should just be able to tell everyone how to live their life. Like, no, I like upward mobility. Like, it's, it's good. Like, I, I like that I was born uh, a middle class on Long Island, and now I live in the country, um, have a homestead, and I'm building something that is on its way to becoming very, very prosperous. That's motivating to me. And then you let people like, oh, so you're motivated by money? Partly. I mean, my main motivation is I believe in what I do, but why wouldn't I be motivated by money? You're not motivated by money. I'm not motivated by money. Of course you are. What are you talking about? People just lie. Just lie, 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 lie. Capitalism is a naturally motivating system and it creates very good things. It, it breeds creativity from people who are motivated by um, making money and improving their lives. And then when you get the right mixture of people who are doing that in a way that is moral with things they believe in, like Andrew Torba with Gab, right? Andrew Torba is making a very nice life for himself. Andrew Torba is an amazing human being. Andrew Torba is an amazing human being. Everyone should support Gab. He's a moral man. He's a principled man. We need more Andrew Torbas in the world. Please enlighten me. I'm 18 and I'm about to get a degree and work multiple jobs. Well, that's fine. You're young and you're hustling and good for you. Um, good for you working multiple jobs. I mean, it shows you have a lot of ambition. But what you really want to do is find what you're passionate about, something you believe in, right? Find something you believe in and then start building a side business based around that and spend two hours a night, an hour a night, two hours a night, instead of watching TV, building that business. And you'll strike out and you'll strike out once, you'll strike out twice, you'll strike out three times. Eventually you'll start to figure it out. And the beautiful thing about that, that rugged individualism is when you do that and you start to work for yourself rather than some soulless corporation, your work becomes exponential. So for a corporation, you're going to cap out at, um, you can only make so much money, right? But I mean, theoretically you can make a lot, but when you run your own business, the work could become exponential. You can start to make more and more money, and then you can use that money to one, live a better life because there's nothing wrong with that, and two, to start to use the money to support the things that you like in the world. And that could mean hiring good people. Like I just had someone 
build out our new user portal and our new website. And I could have went to like a big tech company and had that done. Instead, I worked with a high school dropout who um, had recently started his own business. And I paid this high school dropout who had recently started his own business thousands and thousands of dollars to build this new website, to build this user portal and do a lot of really good things. And now my money is going to in-group preference. It's going to what I believe in. This is how you start to make an impact in the world. As I bring in teachers, right? I'm not looking for teachers that are going to teach children things that make them want to be communist, right? I'm looking for like-minded good people that I can employ, right? So you start to fund the things that you believe in. Capitalism can be a beautiful thing when it's practiced in a moral way. And our children need to understand what that is, what rugged individualism is, if they are going to um, live the fulfilling life we want them to live. Otherwise, they'll just be like, we need to abolish the capitalistic system and the state needs to take care of us. I'm so miserable. Well, you know, I'm living the American dream. It's just not the same dream it was three years ago. It's the same dream. But it has to be the real American dream, not the one the banker sold to you. What are my thoughts on Ayn Rand? I like Ayn Rand. Um, I think she had a, a good mind. I, you know, I don't necessarily subscribe to libertarian philosophy but I think she had a good mind and um, she pointed out a lot of the strengths of free market economics and the problems with um, socialistic, communistic government control. I hate when this jumps, it's so annoying. I lose, I lose my place. Ah, I was born to be a cowboy. I really was. No, I agree with that. Monopolies are capitalism. Like you have capitalism, you're going to get monopolies. But then what you have to do is have a moral population and build parallel systems, right? I mean, you could say that, oh, well, you know, e even from like um, what I do, right? You're like, oh, well, you know, how can you compete with the education system? How can you compete with the education system? Well, I just started building it from the grassroots level. Or, you know, I could have had, um, I could have had a big tech company build my website and a big tech company make my user portal, but I worked with a high school dropout. Why? Because I don't care about the monopoly, I'm going to support the grassroots thing. So people, don't spend your money in Walmart. Spend your money at a mom and pop shop, even if you have to pay more money, right? So ultimately, freedom comes from the manner through which we live our lives. I want someone teaching my kids that share the same morals and values that I do. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, Andrew Jackson crushed. Does anyone know who was supposed to be on the Titanic? Eh, you know, just a, just a couple of bankers who were against the <laughs> who were against the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank. No big deal. Nothing to see there. So, you wanna give your children a foundation in their rights. Why? What is the why of the Bill of Rights? What is the why of their rights? Someone just walked in the door, so if the dogs go crazy, 
Yeah, well, J.P. Morgan was a real son of a you-know-what. Um, in fact, if you look up the Congressional Reese Committee, which was a 1950s congressional committee, um, you'll find that they discovered that J.P. Morgan and um, the Rockefellers and a few of these tax-exempt foundations actually conspired to get America into World War I, right? So these, were, these are bad organizations, conglomerates, people, right? But that's okay. There's always going to be bad people. There's always going to be a World Economic Forum, a United Nations, a New World Order. There's always going to be them or they. What are they doing? No, stop asking what are they doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Right? I, I'm one man. I'm one man. I've, I've published seven children's books. The Right to Bear Arms, Operation Mockingbird and the Church Committee, Free Speech, Social Media Beep, and the First Amendment, right? Seven books. I started a homeschool company from the best grassroots level. Courses on the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, the American Revolution, logical fallacies, colonial America, right? Um, the medical industrial complex, the media industrial complex, art, crafts, science based on the scientific method. I'm one guy. Look what Andrew Torba has built. Look at what Owen Benjamin and all of them over in Bertaria have built. For anyone familiar with that amazing group of people, right? Parallel systems. Stop worrying about what they are doing. They want you worrying about what they are doing. Just imagine there's two groups of people playing chess and the first group is make, making moves and they're getting position and they're scheming and all you're doing is just complaining about what they're doing. Who's going to win the game? You need to start making moves on your chessboard. And if you're not making moves on your chessboard, then stop complaining about what they are doing because then you deserve to have them do it to you. For now, it's a choice. He doesn't have to participate in digital currency at this time. Well, even that, even that, right? There's physical gold and silver. There's bartering. There's chicken eggs. There's growing food. There's so much that we can do. And when enough morality spreads, they can't push their agendas like what is coming, the digital currency. Freedom comes from the manner through which you live your life. Freedom comes from the manner through which you live your life. Freedom comes from the manner through which you live your life. It does not come from government. You are endowed by your creator with certain inalienable rights amongst them. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But that doesn't mean you get to keep them if you don't protect them. You were endowed by your creator with these rights. But ultimately, it's the way in which you live your life. They won't tell you that in all these corrupt churches, but you were endowed with those rights. Mega Mom doesn't have TikTok. Well, if anyone's in the Discord, let her know that we are on YouTube right now as well. We are live on YouTube. We are live on TikTok. So you teach your children the American Revolution. And once you do that, they have a foundation. Now you can teach them governmental structure, introduction to civics. So you start to teach them introduction to civics. And the first thing you do is you teach them the difference between monarchy, democracy, and a republic. And of course, we live in a republic. Once you establish that we live in a republic, and they'll understand why, right? Because we had just came from no taxation without representation. We had just came from a monarchy, a hereditary monarchy. 
which is the worst kind, hereditary, because you get the brats of these kings, right? Hereditary monarchy, where it was a dictatorship, right? I mean, yeah, parliament was involved, but that, that's not the system they wanted to live under. Democracy, of course, is a disaster, right? A democracy is just the majority oppressing the rights of, of the minority. But a republic is governed by a constitution that is designed to protect the rights of, of everyone. And ironically, the people have been trained to hate our republic so much that because they think they think other systems will better protect the rights of minorities, which is it's hilarious. Right, tyranny of the majority. The democracy is very dangerous. I mean, how would how would you think you think March of 2020 was bad under our republic? Man, you should have see you should see what it would have been under a democracy. Oh boy. Right? So you teach them the um, systems of government. Then you teach them about the three branches of government. Right? We teach them about the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judicial branch. Oh, yeah. BLM, the mask stuff. It would have been a disaster. Disaster under democracy. Um, a, the, a republic is actually made to move slow. Like, Change is hard. It's supposed to take time, and that's good. That's by design. A republic is a great system. The constitutional republic that we live under is a great system, as corrupt and infuriating, infuriating as it could be. So you teach them the three branches of government. You teach them the executive branch, what the executive branch does. They don't really have a lot of power there, but they have some power. The legislative branch, senators, the House, right? What they do and voting and where your power lies in voting. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you have more power in federal elections or state elections? State elections. Do you have more power in state elections or local elections? Local elections, right? Who's your sheriff? Who is the president of your local school board? Right? That is where your power comes from. That is where your power comes from. That's where, or that's where your power is, right? So use your power. Local elections. Local, 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 local. Teach your children that. And then you teach them about the judicial system. And one of the things we learned after March of 2020 is how many people were completely unaware of how to use the judicial system to protect their rights, which is a big problem. Big problem, right? People are unaware of how to use the judicial system to protect their rights because our children should be taught what an affidavit is. Our children should be taught what a notice of liability is. Our children should be taught what a conditional consent is. And then as we start to build up, by the time they're 18 years old, they can have an idea of how to properly exercise their rights using the system that was set forth by the founding fathers. Because ultimately, the system is no different than a hammer. The court system is a hammer. It's just a hammer that most people have no idea how to use. We teach our children how to use the hammer. Teach our children how to use the hammer. So we teach them that. We start to teach about relevant legislation like the Organic Act of 1871. We can start to get into things like the straw man and the birth certificate and all of this good stuff, but only if they have a foundation in what their rights are and where their rights come from. And that is how you teach your children their rights. Thank you. That is a cute hammer. It's not, all right, a cute hammer, okay? This is a multi-purpose tool, all right? I got the pliers. I got the wire cutter. Oh, you, you keep mocking it. Keep mocking it. Hold on. It's like an open set tool. Got a saw. I was 
digging a hole for um, putting in a fence, and there was a big root deep in the hole, and I got in there with this saw, and do 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 This is a great tool. It's a great tool. All right. So we teach our children their rights and where they come from. And then we teach them to live free. So what does that mean? We, one, we focus on critical thinking over memorization when they're children. We prioritize skill development, art and music and construction and engineering and the development of real skills or plumbing or hair cutting and then photography, videography. And then we use these skills to do what we can to get our children or guide them toward getting entrepreneurial experience. And when you do these things and you teach them their rights and you teach them financial literacy, then they start to grow up with the mindset of freedom and they start to um, understand how to live a free life. And ultimately that's what we want. And, and that's why I focus so much on learning their rights and critical thinking and skill development and all of these different things. And if we put it all together, you get an 18 year old that is a wrecking ball of freedom. And ultimately that is what we're producing. And that's really what I wanted to cover today here people. You can find what I do at www.classicallearner.com. It's Homeschools Connected, our community, um, which includes our community as well as our curriculum, is $15 a month. And um, I don't know, that's what we got. Max was raised by liberal parents and he loves the Constitution and his country. That's awesome. Divorce now. Yeah, they tend to do that. They tend to do that. You know, their God is more um, the materialistic. And when you're materialistic in nature, it's harder to get through those tough times, right? Because ultimately in your marriage, you're going to have tough times, right? Like the majority of divorces happen when children are between zero and five years of age because there's so much stress. Um, but you got to be willing to stick out the tough times. And like in my marriage, I mean, we've had tough times and because we got through that, we're closer and more loyal to each other than ever before, because we saw that neither one of us were willing to quit during the tough times. And you start to really cement that bond. And, you know, that's what it's all about. Yeah, um, the, the, can I recommend a lifestyle? Yes, you need to do everything you can. I understand that not everyone could do this right away and that's fine, but you do everything you can to get out of debt and live within your means, even if that means not getting the nice car or getting the smaller house or um, do everything you can to live your life out of debt because they leverage us with financial control, right? Um, you want to not be reliant on corporations, so you want to start a side business and slowly start growing it so that in two or three years, you could start to take control of your life and your financial situation and your employment. You want to build community in Bertaria. I like that Owen always says, 10 people within, no 10 people within 10 miles that you could count on, like-minded people, have in-group preference, so buy from, people who are like-minded to you rather than from Walmart, um, right? Keep that money, that circuit in community. Community is really big. Homeschool your kids, get married, have lots of children, put family first, follow God. You do these things and you start to live a very free life. So um, yeah, lifestyle is very important and everyone can do it, but you have to get past the point of, oh, it must be nice. No, like, it doesn't happen overnight. You just start making changes. Live sober. 
You know, don't get drunk all the time. I haven't had a drink in years. I think over three years I haven't had a drink. Um, live sober. Be responsible. Stop wasting your time watching all the garbage. And life starts to get better and better. So, all right, guys. www.classicallearner.com And, um... You, we are homeschools connected is our curriculum um, in our private homeschool community. So check that out. It's $15 a month. And um, yeah, yeah, I could have a guest on. So you have a curriculum. I just started homeschool for my 15 year old. Yeah, it's $15 a month. Um, you should definitely jump on it. You get access to the courses that I teach, which is obviously valuable as well as all of the other amazing resources that we put out. And we, we put out lessons that are, I mean, I make them myself. So obviously I think they're phenomenal. So yeah, classicallearner.com, homeschools connected. Check us out, people. I'm going to drink this now in honor of Melissa. And then we are going to call it a stream. I'm going to splash myself in the face in honor of Melissa. Water out of a milk jug, blasphemy. No, 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 no. This is the right way. Did you just look at my drink and think that I'm not doing it the right way? What do you drink out of? Yeah, uh-huh. You probably drink out of a metal cup. Ugh, terrible. Or plastic and it's leaking chemicals. Now, this is chemical-free glass, right? Chemical-free glass. Get the water in there. It fits a ton of water, so you don't have to keep refilling it. It feels good to the touch, like the temperature matches the temperature of the water. It's just really good. And then you have lemon slices, which is delicious for the flavor, and homegrown, I grow these in my backyard, organic mint leaves. Man, this water tastes so good, you just want to drink it all day. Mm, and when it's cold, ooh, get some ice cubes in there. My, mm, golly. Oh, yeah, I'm doing it right, people. You better believe I'm doing it right. This is how you drink water. You call that knife? <laughs> All right, guys. Lots of fun. I do got to run. Got stuff I got to do. All right. Got things to do.